Yes, um, Councillor Dickinson sends apologies and uh, you have agreed to chair as a substitute councillor, can you? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and also just to note that this is Celeste's first meeting as a secretary for this panel, so thank you to Celeste also. Um, the second item is if there's any declarations of interest, um, is there any that anyone would like to declare? No? Okay, there is one that I would like to know. I'd like to note for the purposes of transparency that I'm a resident in a council property myself at this moment. Um, that shouldn't impact me being a member on this panel or co-chairing, um, sub-chairing at the moment. Um, so the next item is chair's announcements. Um, there's no announcements for me, so that's quite a quick one. Um, and then the next item on the agenda is notes of the previous panel, um, notes of the previous meeting, I'm sorry. Um, is the panel happy to approve the meeting minutes of 3rd July 2004, 24, or is there any amendments from anyone? No amendments? Okay, we'll note those as approved. Um, also, a slight uh, reorder of the um, agenda, please, if that's okay. I'd like to suggest that we take um, the initial original item seven, which is temporary accommodation and homelessness update first, and then we'll take item six, that was housing complaint handling annual report after that. And then that's going to be followed by the original item five, which was the work plan, followed by a report back on recommendations and then dates of the future meetings. This is just to make the most use of uh, efficient time of officers' time. Um, so if everyone's happy with that, we'll go on to item five, which is temporary accommodation and homelessness update, please. Um, I'd like to invite officers uh, Neris Perry, Richard Wood, Kieran Ad Edmonds, and Abby Baird, as well as I think Councillor uh, Smith for this item. Um, Linda or um, Neris, would you like to introduce your report on this item? Shall I say a few words first? Yeah, is that okay? Um, yeah, I mean, I think all members of the panel will be aware of the enormous challenges that we're facing as a city, as a council, um, with temporary accommodation at the moment, with a re record number of people, households presenting as homeless and being eligible for, for council support. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, we just haven't got enough um, uh, units of temporary accommodation um, to deal with the current crisis. You know, the, the, the number of units that we've had um, has been enough in previous years, um, but because we haven't got enough uh, temporary accommodation homes to, to, to make available to people um, at, at the moment, we, there has been uh, an increasing trend towards having to place people uh, in nightly accommodation, in, in bed and breakfast accommodation or hotel accommodation. Um, and that is, of course, awful for the individuals involved, um, particularly, you know, families, um, you know, not having access to cooking facilities, having to worry about getting kids to school, not having the, the space uh, they need uh, just for any quality of life. Um, but it's putting an enormous pressure on the council as well, uh, financial pressure. Um, and we've been projecting overspends of over three million pounds a year because of this uh, extra expense of having to, to place households in uh, temporary accommodation. Um, but an enormous work has been going on, as you'll see from the report. The officers have been working really hard on a, a wide range of mitigations um, in order to uh, reduce the cost to the council and critically reduce um, the, the number of families having to be in hotel kind of accommodation um, for any length of time, particularly the, the six week figure um, which is you know, the, um, the 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 the, um, the sort of standards that you know we don't want people to be in uh, that kind of accommodation for any length of time at all. But uh, the the target is um, six weeks in terms of like not breaching that, um, and we've made great strides uh, towards that. Um, I did want to just briefly share. Um, uh, the content, uh, some of the contents of a letter which came from um, 
MHCLG uh, to the council um, praising our progress in this area. Um, I think it, uh, it, it it's worth um, reading out here. Um, so this is a letter from officials um, in the Ministry of Housing and Local Government um, to our chief executive uh, praising the work of the team. Uh, and they say, I'm aware that like many authorities, Oxford is seeing an increase in approaches from both families and single households and that this has had a significant impact upon demand for temporary accommodation. However, you have taken a proactive approach to seeking innovative solutions, which you have delivered at pace. This has led to a significant reduction in B&B placements for families, including particularly those placed in excess of six weeks down to very low numbers. Your comprehensive monitoring and program of work, including cabinet approval for your procurement of emergency temporary accommodation framework and update on rising homelessness, TA demand and mitigations began very much in advance of published data and a breach in the Homeless Suitability Order 2003. And I wanted to pass on my appreciation for the efforts of the whole team to respond proactively to these challenges. Your very comprehensive B&B elimination plan demonstrated the breadth of work being undertaken to address the position and respond to future demand. In particular, the private rental offer and the development and launch of Oxford's private sector leasing scheme demonstrates innovation and is an approach that we recognise as good practice. And I'm grateful for your team's willingness to share this with other local authorities. So, um, yeah, I think that's high praise indeed from uh, uh, the government department. Um, and I'd just like to, yeah, sort of echo the, the, those comments and thank the team for the really good work that they're doing in this area. Thank you, Linda. That was Thank you. That's really it. Good. Okay. Uh, Neris, would you like to say anything? Um, I will, if it's okay, Councillor um, Kaim, I will hand it over to my team, actually, who um, are the team who is delivering all of this work. And I think um, I think they are best placed to just take you through some of those kind of key areas of mitigation um, and progress that we've made. So um, I'll hand over to Richard and, and, and his colleagues. Yeah. I think Kieran's going to um, cover it today. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I just wanted to thank um, Councillor Smith for the kind words. It's 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 really appreciated and just thank you for everything you've said i'll make sure i'll pass that on to the colleagues on on the ground um it was a very comprehensive sort of update councillor smith provided but i can just provide a bit of a narrative around some of the detail in the report and i'm happy to sort of answer any questions afterwards if if, if that's okay so just to start off with in terms of the demand placed on temporary accommodation um Although lots of great work is going on and lots of mitigations are taking place, we are still seeing a very high level of demand um, in our temporary accommodation, particularly around the current weekly placement rate. So that's the rate of um, households going into temporary accommodation where we owe a duty to house. Um, and as a result of that, that means subsequently the amount of legal duties we owe. So that's the relief duties where the council or that household the statutory duty to relieve their homelessness has also uh, the amount of cases has has increased as well um um which 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 is obviously a correspondence from the high level of demand but in terms of the number of households in temporary accommodation at the moment um as of you know the result in the report there's been a slight drop in the overall number of uh, households in temporary accommodation now that is due to the significant investment the council has made in homelessness prevention and the increased move on offer we have to to rehouse families in temporary accommodation but there is like there is the undertone of there is still a high demand i think that just needs to be sort of noted we are still dealing with a high demand and if it wasn't for their mitigations we we you know we would still have we wouldn't have seen that decline necessarily um, in terms of households, so the overall number uh, was 238 in the report, but some of that will be in our sort of generic our stock, which we own and, and lease, and then some other nightly paid accommodation. Uh, we have 105 of, overall in, in the report, but one of the things which Councillor Smith sort of stated earlier was particularly households with children and pregnant pregnant households over six weeks. There's a statutory sort of uh, legislation which stipulates, puts rules on the authority around how long 
families can be in nightly paid and B&B accommodation and not have self-contained facilities. And that is six weeks. And as you can see, very positively, you know, we don't want any ultimately, but positively the, it has gone down from 14 to, to three as outlined in the report. And we will drive, we're going to continue to drive as we, as we're going to, we want that to be zero. Um, and we're pursuing that. In terms of just an update on the demand mitigations, the council have sort of invested in staff, particularly in this sort of homeless prevention offer. So that's when our housing options team and our sort of early intervention team, which is helping accept duties, the prevention duties and resolving homelessness, which is really positive. Um, the number of prevention duties being 50% has it's been achieved, which is really good because the more prevention duties we accept means that the sooner we can resolve the outcome and less relief, meaning less placements into temporary accommodation. So again, that's really good to see. Um, and then really the, the other one is the amount of prevention duties which are being discharged with a positive outcome um, as well. So that, that's really quite positive to see that that sort of on track at the moment um we are still developing as councillor smith said our our private sector leasing scheme which is where we sort of enter leasing agreements with private landlords to then use that property to provide temporary accommodation that program is it's still rolling out and we are we, we are sort of on track which is the, the report provides further detail but we're, we're still pursuing that and it's still a driving factor in sort of overall less less temporary accommodation, less reliance on nightly paid temporary accommodation. The council continues to use more of its own stock to use for the purpose of temporary accommodation, um, which, you know, is required, but we've been very, you know, we're just mindful of the balance between using the stock for temporary accommodation and, and, and the move on limitations that could have. So we're still sort of, that's something we're still carefully balancing, but it is an action we're still delivering on. Um, and then, the procurement of the new temporary accommodation framework um, has now been successfully sort of published and is currently an active sort of tender. Um, so yeah, that, that's really positive. And then the last last sort of thing in the report just to, to go over is around the sort of increased move on for homeless households. So over the last sort of in the report, as it, as it sort of states, we've maximized not only the private sector leasing of private landlords but also to enter in agreements with private sector landlords to offer settled accommodation in the private rented sector and we're continuing to live to deliver that which is very positive and then the access to social housing so that relates to sort of how the percentage we allocate of social housing to those in homeless need or on the homeless list and as the report that's 40 percent of, of of lets are going to the homeless list which has a which obviously the council responding through its allocations policy to the demand we're currently sort of under. Um, unless Richard and Eris has anything they'd like to add, I'm happy to sort of take questions. You've covered it, Kieran. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you so much for that update, um, Kieran and Linda. That's really good to know. Um, can I ask if there's any questions from the panel? Okay, uh, Rosie has a question. We'll take questions in three for efficient timing, but Rosie, do you want to go first? And then I'll add mine afterwards. Great, thank you so much. And thank you in echoing praise for the amount of like creative uh, thinking that has gone into finding ways to manage this. And, and with thanks to the team and thank you for the report. Um, I was just um, kind of a couple of broad questions, I suppose. Um, one was just noting um, I suppose how many of these things are out of our control as a as a city council and the pressures and the reasons behind this that from funding to government policy, increased rent inflation, etc, as those that are listed in the report. And I was sort of a question perhaps to Councillor Smith and the cabinet is with a new government, what opportunities are there for us to lobby for changes at the national level that could help us? Well, could help reduce the pressure, but also help us manage the increased pressure. I would be interested to um know your thoughts on that and then also i just noted as a second second question if that's okay is um uh, a mention of like increased staffing um to help with the housing needs team and i just wondered um yeah if there are any other areas of like increased need uh that may be useful for us to consider in the upcoming budget setting i suppose um given these kind of outcomes in this being a real uh high area of need thanks 
Thanks, Rosie. So that's three questions to begin with. Um, can I invite officers to respond to those? Um, uh, maybe on the um, uh, the what's in car control. Maybe should I have a go at answering that? Then maybe Abby, because you're um, actually our options team leader, you can maybe add any thoughts in regards to what you're seeing on the ground. Um, so yeah, uh, overall, it's, it's most of the factors that are causing increases in homelessness in the city. We have very limited control over. Um, the main three sources of homelessness that we're seeing at the moment that then result into placements are um, evictions from the prior rented sector. That's very strongly linked to um, very high um, rental inflation at the moment. Very difficult for us to keep up with uh, with, up with those levels um, linked to um, wider changes in the country and the economy, cost of living, um, interest rates, etc. And you know, this is we're is what's being reported to us from um from MHCLG and um, other officers and other other authorities, it's a very similar picture across the the south of England, especially in urban authorities. We're all, we're all seeing these pressures. Um, in more more localized, but still very limited control, is that we have a lot of pressure from um, a home office um, asylum hotel in located in the city. Um, when people successfully um, uh, gain a, gain asylum, they then after a short period of notice are evicted. And um, many of those um, residents then present to us and we have to rehouse many of them. So again, it's we have very limited control of that, but we do um, lobby central government in, in this area and um, both for, in, in terms of the, the suitability of that, that accommodation, but also how much notice that they're giving residents um, before they then um, evict them. Um, we, uh, also another local factor, but again, we're seeing this across the country is changes to the to the rules around domestic abuse. There's there's no local connection for, for DA for, for good reason, um, but it, we are finding that in Oxford we have dis probably disproportionate numbers in presenting to us. It could just be that Oxford is known as a good place um, with good services for, for people who are affected by domestic abuse. Um, and we certainly obviously we, we can't and we don't turn anyone away. but. That does seem to be a particular issue that's um that's, that's impacting on on demand at the moment. Um, Abby, I don't know if you've got anything to add to any of that, and then I can um, see Linda's hands up as well. Um, no, just to say, there's also been I guess some slight legal changes that were out of our control as well. So the threshold for priority need is much lower now um, than it was a few years ago, which which does impact the amount of people that are eligible for temporary accommodation. Um, and it's similar with kind of intentional homeless decisions. So some of that's changed around kind of care leavers, um, which again kind of impacts our numbers and, and the people that are eligible for temporary accommodation long term. Linda, do you want to? Yeah, so I was just going to you know, welcome the fact that MPs last night voted for the Renters' Rights Bill, um, finally making progress on banning no-fault evictions. Um, so that is good. We know that evictions from the private rented sector are, um, you know, that's a, a large cause of presentations for, for homelessness in the city. So movement on that is all very well on and good. Um, in terms of where we'd like the new government to go further, um, I think there's uh, you know lobbying work to do perhaps about increasing um, the funding for temporary accommodation, the TA rate, so it actually covers the cost to councils when we have to put people in nightly charge accommodation, um, and of course the big one, you know, more money for council housing for social housing um so that you know we're not putting having to put people in temporary accommodation at all so that we've got affordable homes for everyone that needs one um you know that's that's uh, the big lobbying ask as far as i'm concerned okay thank you for that linda um edward i see you've got a question um do you want to go next sure um Thanks very much, and thank you for the report. Um, so I've noted previously that um, we do uh, undertake rehousing of, of people who need council homes to neighbouring districts, um, and I have had a case of somebody who very much didn't want that to happen, it, it did still happen. Um, so my question would be whether we have those kind of arrangements with the neighbouring districts in relation to temporary accommodation um, and if so, what kind of relief it sort of puts on on, on our own sort of demand? Um, 
and also likewise the extent to which that happens with rehousing people for council housing um and then you know uh, going back to the sort of na national picture which which is highlighted differently previously uh, in relation to the planning inspectorate's decision to uh, reject our local plan um where where is it anticipated that's going to leave our, our ability to um, continue to improve our figures on on people who are housed in temporary accommodation and being successfully rehoused in, in our own uh, council housing. Thank you, Edward. Um, can I pass along to officers for answers? Uh, Kieran, do you want me to maybe go and then I can probably need a bit of help from, from you and Abby. Um, there's, there's, yeah. we, we do rehouse outside of Oxford, uh, which is pretty, it's, it's pretty inevitable because of the very tight boundaries that, that we have for the city. Um, there's different ways and um, uh, different ways and um, features of how we do that. Um, so in terms of temporary accommodation, um, all the vast, vast majority of our TA stock is held within the city, but we do have some stock um, in the surrounding towns in Oxfordshire. Um, so uh, people are, are placed there um, you know, and, that, and often avoiding the need for um, being placed in hotels. Um, because we do own um, uh, units out in, in the surrounding towns. Um, there are suitability checks whenever we do that. Um, if, 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 if members want a bit more information on that, Kieran and Abby are probably better placed than me. Um, and then in terms of um, permanent rehousing, as in for, for long-term accommodation, um, we've, for a long time, we've used private rented sector um, units um, in Oxfordshire um, to rehouse people. Some of those are, um, I think, I don't know, Kieran, you can come in, but the majority are um, uh, voluntary. So people often want to want, want a house that's affordable um, in Oxfordshire and, and, and are happy to, to accept that, although we, we can do formal offers to suitable private rented properties um, in, in the county. And then the final um, thing I would, would mention is that through the local plan process that the previous one, um, because of the um, Oxford unmet need that the districts now have to um, deliver, it, it means, and it's now starting to happen, um, affordable housing done through housing registers are now becoming available for Oxford residents in the four districts. So the first units are now being um, delivered in Vale. Um, so these um, these units are either affordable social rents and um, our, uh, our, our residents, if they bid for those properties on those registers, um, uh, get them and they, that's been very successful in the last few months um, a lot of people who were um, either at risk or becoming homeless have been rehoused successfully um, in those units that are very close to the city boundary so um, they're the kind of different tools we have Kieran I can see your hands up so please feel free to add to what I've said I think, I think, <clears throat> Thanks Rich I think that was very comprehensive I was just going to provide a bit around a bit more uh, just around the statutory legislation we, we need to work from so um, part of our duties to rehouse is to find settled accommodation, which is suitable uh, as per sort of the homelessness code of guidance and the uh, suitability order. And under Localism Act, that gives us the, the powers to discharge um, um, our, duty, our duties of accommodation via a suitable offer of private rented accommodation. Richard's correct. When we look at available properties, we, we always try our best to work from the city first. Um, so we try to procure local accommodation first. However, it is sort of worth noting there are residents who approach us who do need to be and want to be located outside of the city, but within the district. So it can be quite a useful asset to us to be able to procure that accommodation. Whenever we're looking to sort of nominate a suitable resident to a property, we always have a comprehensive suitability assessment and always take quite a holistic approach where we can to be able to, you know, offer that property to somebody who 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 is open to moving. But there is such a limitation sometimes with the accommodation available, we do have to discharge our duty. Um, but it is in line with sort of national legislation and, and guidance. So yeah, that is um that's and we do have temporary accommodation provision again outside of the city in itself, but um that, that but that can be quite useful because again we do have people who approach us who for for their circumstances as Richard said earlier around domestic abuse do do need to be outside of the city so to have that sort of resource available is is very useful and the other thing I would comment on as well around the relationship between sort of the local authorities 
we do have sort of, there is sort of code of guidance and national sort of uh, legislation where local authorities are encouraged to comply with one another. So where, where you can, you can enter sort of reciprocal agreements that if we need to, for example, do a transfer or, or look at other properties in other areas, so should that, that can happen as well. So that is something we do, we do, we do do time to time. So I hope that provides a bit of sort of context. It might be worth just noting we have a private sector discharge policy document on our website as well, which definitely references sort of the sort of criteria we look at when when nominating for a suitable property, particularly out of area. Thank you for that, Kieran. Um, I've also got a really quick question. Also, just to say thank you for the update report in its whole. Um, it's, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work that the team's been put through, but it's good to see how much work that you're doing to mitigate these risks and how much you're able to achieve. My question was about the PSL scheme. It's noted that 18 of the 30 units are already in use. I'm assuming the remaining units are just having maintenance done and then they're going to be put into use as soon as possible. I just wanted to confirm if that's the case or if there's any other issues that are making them not being used. No, I can comment, Richard, and then there is if there's anything you want to add. So, yeah, so with the accommodation, we there are accommodation which is in use, but before we um, you know let that accommodation, we need to make sure that they're to compliance or they would we need to make sure that the relevant checks and the relevant certification is in place um, and relevant lease agreements are sort of done in line with our constitution and things like that. So they're in they're in process. But what I would say is there's still a positive procurement program at the moment, which, you know, as the report details, we're we're sort of unrolling. But yes, there is with with our sort of any property we offer, whether it's private rented or for the purpose of temporary accommodation, we do need to ensure consistency and compliance across all of our stock. Um as well with the nature of temporary accommodation with it for example usually with accommodation you offer you might know a little bit more about the residents within the accommodation so again it's it's just around making sure the properties are suitable and, and are compliance that that hope that provides some sort of context behind it okay thank you kieran is there any other questions from the panel no okay um Neris. oh sorry Neris, please do go ahead so, sorry, Chair, I was just going to come back, if it's OK, just to answer the second part of uh, Councillor Rawls' question, actually, on, on staffing and um, cost. Um, just just on that one, um, the authority receives a relatively large uh, grant called the Homelessness Prevention Grant. Um, it's allocated to every local authority, really, to deal with the sort of pressures in this area, whether it's prevention, et cetera, et cetera. So we had an uplift on that grant last year, so we've been able to, re to, to deploy all all of that into some of the additional staffing. So we've been able to do that without putting further pressure really on the sort of general fund budgets, but using that grant to kind of grow the team and enable them to do what they will, to, to, to do um, in the work within this kind of, um, uh, within this table. We'll wait, that grant is in place until March 2025. Um, we are hoping to have a steer either through the autumn statement or in December on what the future um, of that grant will be. It is a critical plank of funding within the authority in terms of the delivery. So um, we don't anticipate anything dramatic, but uh, neither neither we do do we know for sure. So we carry a, an annual risk on that basis. But it's just to note that that's where the, a lot of the additional work and funding comes from. Thank you, Neris. That's really helpful to know. Um, can I ask the panel if you'd like to agree any recommendations for the update? I will take that as a no. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much to the officers for attending. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for the report and for all the work that you do. And the praise that Linda shared at the start of this item, it's, yeah, it's really good to hear that. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, Thanks. I believe some of the officers might need to leave. So we're going to um, go to the next item which is going to be item six, the housing complaint handling annual report. Um, for this um, agenda item, uh, Linda, Neris and Bill are going to introduce the report. Um, who would like to start? Shall I kick off again? I will be shorter this time, I promise. Thanks, Linda. Um, so, of course, we always hope that no one, uh, none of our 
tenants ever have cause to complain, um, but it's important that when they do, uh, we have a complaint system which listens, um, which puts things right where they have gone wrong, um, which communicates well with uh, tenants or stages um, and it, most importantly perhaps it, it allows us to to learn um, from the complaints from the issues raised uh, to improve our service um, and so this report is really important um, both in terms of um, being accountable to our, our tenants and you know having that transparency there um, but also vital for us as a, as a council um, to hold, hold a mirror up um, to ourselves, um, you know, to see how we're doing, challenge our, 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 ourselves, um, and uh, you know, assess, sort of take take stock of take stock of um, where we are in terms of our landlord services. And uh, I think this panel meeting this evening is part of that. So, looking forward to hearing your your observations. Thank you, Linda. Would any other officer like to comment? No? Yeah, if I could, if I could come oh, into sorry, the report. yes, please yeah. do. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on my role here to present the report, but also like to also introduce Kat Mays, who's uh, is our customer care and complaint manager, who uh, is very much the author of the report that's uh, that's in front of you today. I'll I'll just share. Um, the screen for a PowerPoint presentation just to talk you through, but I'm hoping that everyone's taken the uh, the opportunity to uh, to actually read the the complaint report in in, in detail. Um, so hopefully you can see um, the uh, outline of the well, the presentation. Um, this is our first annual uh, complaint performance and service improvement report. The housing ombudsman. Um, the compliance with the Housing Ombudsman's uh, Code of Conduct uh, became law in April just past, uh, following the Social Housing Regulation Act last summer. Um, and uh, part of it, we're required to now produce an annual report. A, there is a Code of Conduct, which we must comply with, and we also have to do a, an annual assessment against the uh, against the, the Code of Complaint Handling. And uh, this is our first report, as I say. Um, the Ombudsman wasn't entirely specific on everything that they wanted to see in a report or how they wanted to uh, it to be um, covered. Um, so there's there's probably the best part of four or five hundred versions of these uh, annual reports up and down the country. But this is our, our first one. And obviously, we'll, we'll learn from this over time. And it covers a period from April 23 to March 24. And it's purely in relation to the council's landlord function. That's where we're the, the landlord for our tenants. Uh, it doesn't cover all the other uh, activities where the council does receive complaints. Um, one of the requirements of this report and well, and the code is that it must be uh, endorsed by the, the governing body, which is cabinet. And this report is tracking to cabinet next next week and there's also a requirement for cabinet to provide a response to uh, to the report and publish that with, alongside the, the self-assessment uh, and the report which we'll do by the end of this month. Some of you may be aware that the local government and social care ombudsman uh, is looking to align uh, the uh, code of complaint handling with the housing ombudsman to have a single code of complaint handling for all local authority complaints uh, so we may find that the report next year is a combined one, including housing as one of the elements. But that's one of the things we'll, we've just got to wait and see what that, uh, try and how that transpired. There's an expectation from the local government, social care ombudsman, that all local authorities should look to voluntarily adopt the code before it comes to legislation. In terms of just brief over, over uh, overview and highlights, um, in terms of complaints the the total for the the period is 565 the vast majority uh, 431 sit with ODS uh, primarily in relation to day-to-day uh, -day repairs uh, as you'd expect being the largest number of transactions the council has with uh, OCC making up the remainder of the remaining 134. Uh, ODS carry out around 37,000 repairs per year. So just to put that into a bit of context, uh, obviously we don't always get it right, um, and but it's very important that we have a 
a robust um, complaints process that actually responds to uh, complainants requirements and uh, seeks to understand what the learning is. These are the stage one complaints and in stage two complaints, uh, the majority of those that were in here were upheld at stage one, so they weren't going to not be upheld at stage two. Uh, very often people were looking uh, looking some other uh, issues of redress, uh, some other issues that might be raised. Uh, and obviously the numbers here are much, much lower. There is one, uh, one um, thing that we are required to make sure is in our report is any interactions with the Housing Ombudsman. And sadly, in July 2023, we received our first and only complaint handling failure order uh, in relation to a, uh, a, a case relating to repairs where the, the complaint wasn't responded to in time. Um, and uh, the, the actual issues, um, although they got resolved, um, it led to another problem in responding to the, um, the complaint in that stage two, which resulted, because it over time uh, resulted in a complaint handling failure order. In terms of the key themes and improvements, uh, the set out in the, the report in detail, but damp and mould come, has come across as a, a big thing. One of the things that we've we've done over the past 18 months or so part of the, uh, the the code of complaint handling is that we're now required by law to have an ongoing publicity campaign to encourage people to report complaints, uh, which is why ourselves, uh, as, as alongside all other social housing landlords, have seen a huge increase in complaints over the, the past year or so, some of them up 85, 90%. Um, big area for us that we've identified as requiring improvement is communication. And there's been lots of improvements across different service areas in terms of responsiveness. There's now requirements under the uh, consumer standards um, uh, that are set out by the regulator that we must keep tenants informed on repairs. So some big shifts in the whole sector in terms of improving communication and keeping tenants up to date. We've also had the ODS locale system, which is the uh, the, the Amazon service of, uh, of of repairs where people get confirmation of an appointment, they get the reminders, they get the, uh, the, the day before reminder, uh, operative on the way, track them on the map, send them a message if you're next door, all that kind of stuff, which is now in there, uh, as well as a real time um, transactional satisfaction survey the moment the, uh, the actual um, repair is completed, uh, uh, text messages sent asking for people to give their, their scores and any scores less than uh, satisfactory um, are, are basically uh, sent back. Uh, we had, uh, I know Councillor Smith's uh, heard this before, but one of the, the early examples was someone who um, they got a poor score and uh, the planners in ODS have to register every single score that comes in and if there's a poor one, they get on the phone straight away to the tenant. And uh, one one operative had done a really good repair job, but left a bag of rubble in the hallway. So they were sent back to pick it up. And uh, to the point now that uh, the uh, operatives are now ringing up the team leaders and planners in ODS to say, how, how did I do this week? So a real change. Um, repair delays, obviously, the, that's a, always a, going to be a big thing, especially with complex one. Complaint handling itself, you know, if we if we do, well, we I think we're around about 98% of our complaints are handled within the required timescales, but it's always a, an issue. There's been lots of learning and service development across ODS and OCC. Um, obviously, in the, the last year or so, we've got our uh, we cut, cut in place, which has made a big difference to the, um, the, the landlord service managing complaints and we, we're also now picking up stage two complaints rather than ODS so we've got that oversight um, and the uh, obviously the future plans uh, coming through for next year um, involving tenants much more in, in, in the complaints process in terms of holding us to account um, improved reporting, there's all sorts of um, really good developments within the ICT arena to give us better reporting and monitoring. Um, across the council, with the, the whole council coming in um, into the, the com complaint realms of the uh, local government's code of uh, complaint handling, we're in some ways a trailblazer and working very closely with the rest of the council. Um, we're using insights and, and the data much more to understand uh, the issues. We're putting in place a complaints policy um, in terms of compensation um, 
which will be aligned to the Housing Ombudsman's guidelines in terms of compensation, um, in terms of feedback and making sure we're um, closing that satisfaction. So the the, um, the feedback loop we're we're intending to publish along um, along the year. Um, actual case studies of where we've actually um, had complaints where things have been upheld. So rather than waiting for an annual report, our, our plan is to uh, to actually publish them along along the, along the way. So that's the kind of um, uh, headlines in terms of the uh, the report. Obviously, there's lots of detail in there, but I'll, I'll take questions. Um, Chair. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Linda. Um, can I ask the panel whether there's any questions? Rosie, do you want to go? Thank you. And thank you again for the paper and the presentation. That was really helpful. Um, and uh, I had a three questions, if that's okay. I hope that's, um, I, I don't think it's too complex though. Um, the first one was just, um, I wondered whether there we had any information on how the number of complaints that we receive proportionate to number of tenants, et cetera, compares across the country and with other councils. Um, and also I rec uh, like very helpful to understand national themes such as like an increase in um, concerns over mould and damp. But I just wondered if there were any other national themes or, or, or areas where actually we were out of step with other councils for, for good or bad. Um, that would be really helpful to understand. And then the second question was on repair delays, um, recognising that there's in the report, there's some explanation for why this might be and, you know, whether it's procurement or awaiting further reports, etc. I wondered um, to what extent we feel that these, like the, the, the delays are things that we or ODS need to work on and that there are like clear actions where we need to be working on reducing that waiting time versus managing expectations from tenants because I recognise it could show two things, whether um, in terms of how people are responding. And then the third question was, um, this might be a bit more niche actually, it was around tenancy management. And this is mainly just due to some recent experience with um, residents locally, is coming across um, people who are having problems for one reason or another with their, like communicating with their tenancy management officer, but not wanting to raise a complaint because their relationship is important with their tenancy management officer. And I just wondered whether we were, how we were thinking about that particular um, tension, I suppose, and how that gets kind of captured in, or other, other ways to manage those kind of tensions before reaching the complaint stage, perhaps. I would just be interested. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, in terms of national themes, the, um, it's, it's clear to see um, that satisfaction with complaint handling across the whole sector has dropped like a stone um, to around, um, well, I think the median uh, for local authorities is around 33% satisfied. Uh, we're, we're around 34 32.5 um dropping from a much higher um thing um we, we're still waiting for the full round of annual reports to be published but just in terms of some of the uh the other ones around i mean we do have some um other rps who do operate in uh in the oxford area which, which are larger than us so not a straight comparison but uh, if we take uh, our colleagues from green square uh, 2016 complaints um, we got a two to million five and a half thousand complaints last year, and Peabody just over six thousand. Obviously, they're larger than us. What I'd like to see is Cambridge, all the other ones, which will will come. And they, a lot of the local authorities mentioned to the ombudsman that they they actually wanted the annual reports published for thirtieth um, of June. With the elections, with our calendar, it's almost impossible, well, it would have been impossible for us to have closed the year's complaints down and then got those reports out and through the democratic process. Um, so a lot of local authorities have said to the Ombudsman, we just can't do it. We're looking at October. So we'll really be looking at seeing um, where we are against those other local authorities of similar size. Um, on repair delays, um, there have obviously been uh, across many different areas delays not just with shortage of labor but also in terms of supply for products um, that, um across many areas obviously damp and mold um, trying to get damp and mold surveyors they are so rare um, it's very very difficult to keep hold of them and retain them um, given that the, the competition out there we've also got um the uh, our law which is going expected to be um announced um 
any time this autumn, which will give prescriptive um, timelines for responding to and dealing with damp and mould. We're already working to the timelines um, that were um, being proposed through the consultation. Um, and in terms of tenancy management and uh, tenancy, uh, tenancy management officers being contactable, we have recognised that is a, a real issue. One of the things that we, we're very much aware of is, and we, we've seen it in our, with our own eyes, um, tenancy management officers probably spend about 80% of their time with other tenants. So when people are ringing in, they're already with another tenant, so they can't take a call. When they're with another tenant, they can't receive the emails and so on. So we're trying to get as many as possible to be directed through to the contact centre. Um, I mean, we uh, the, there was one meeting, Eris and I were in with a tenancy management officer. It was about an hour long, and they had over 15 missed calls from, from tenants. Um, given that we've got contact centre with over 50 people waiting to take the calls, we really want to push people in down and down that route. And many of the calls are not actually tenancy management. Some are, but you know, a large proportion are about repairs, which are very much contact centre, tenancy management can't help with. We've also got um, our transformation proposals, which are coming through to Cabinet in December, I understand. Um, and Neris might want to pick up more, but that's that will cover a whole raft of um, improvements to uh, the, the wider land old service um i think that's three questions i think just about any others thanks bill i think kat would like to say something uh, it was just to add to to what bill said as well um i know in terms of repairs delays the report specifically talks about um things like asbestos testing requirements like that um and that is quite a common one um and we're finding that comes up a lot in complaints where people have issues with how long something's taken. Um, and I think an element of that is, like you said, managing expectations. How can we be doing that? How can we be maintaining contact while that's happening? And that's one of the things that, that we look at with ODS and as part of the learnings from it. Um, the other thing you mentioned about people not wanting to make a complaint because um, they were worried it will damage the relationship. The nice thing about having a separate customer care and complaints team is that if they did feel that making a complaint was necessary, we would be handling that investigation and we would do it as sensitively as we can. We wouldn't go to the person in question. We'd be speaking to their line manager and all that. But if someone was in that situation, didn't want to make a complaint, we, we've still got the customer care part of our job title as well. So whilst if someone has an expression of dissatisfaction, we will always offer them a complaint because we're obliged to do so. Um, it's not the only recourse they have. Um, so we'll always support people. But I do know one of the questions we get a lot from residents is about concerns about whether it will impact how they're treated in future, things like that. Um, so the nice thing about having our team is we are, we're as independent as we can be while sitting within landlord services and within the council, but we are our own little team. And as much as we're there to sort of explain things and investigate things, we're also there to represent the customer's voice. So yeah, we, anyone ever does have concerns, they are more than welcome to sort of talk through things with us and we'll, we can try, try, them try and find the best route as well. Thanks, Kat. I've got a comment and a question. Can I ask if the panel has any others that we can join together? No? Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, I just wanted to comment under learning and service development, what you've done so far in 23, 24 year. I was just really impressed to see the amount of work that you've put into the changes um, and also the amount of work that you've done on communications across all aspects to make sure through departments and through to tenants, how it's clearer or more, and more um, more consistent. So that was really good to read as well as the whole report in general. My question was um, about um, costings and you might not publish this in the report itself, but I wondered whether you keep a note of related costings to complaints. For example, if you need to redo repair works or if you need to pay compensation or if, you know, just kind of considering the amount of officer time that goes into handling these complaints, do you keep a note of how much money this process or this whole thing costs in total? We, we do in terms of the compensation. 
and uh, and that will be developed further over the uh, the next year or so when we uh, to publish our compensation policy. In terms of um, one of the key mantras from for ODS is is is, is fix it first you know first time. Um, so we are um, a lot of the concerns um, in terms of having to go back um, hopefully will be uh, completely avoided by getting it right first time but where it does go wrong at the moment we aren't tracking it was a very good point I think we, we can ask uh, ODS to actually quantify how much essentially it's waste isn't it um, that is uh, being created by having to go back and fix things. Okay thanks so much Bill. Um, is there any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Um, so just to conclude the questions, we had questions on um, comparisons to national themes, um, uh, repair delays, tenancy management kind of relations when reporting uh, complaints and also related costings. Um, would the panel like to agree any recommendations? Um, the last point that Bill made about ODS sharing costings related to waste, would that be a recommendation, um, do you think, or is that just uh, Celeste, Jonathan? Maybe it's just a comment. Sorry, could you, sorry, could you just repeat that, uh, uh, Councillor um, Kayim? Just... Sorry, sorry, Jonathan. My last question, which was related to costs associated with the complaint process, Bill mentioned that ODS, I hope I understood that right, Bill, that ODS um, could kind of share costing details in related to like waste and stuff. That's, it. okay, Bill, do you wanna go? Yeah, I was Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think it's, it is certainly possible. There will, for it to be an automated process, we don't want to, we certainly don't wanna make it labor intensive. Um, yeah. We'll need to speak to ICT colleagues to see if there's a way that where there is a complaint, which is then flagged as a complaint, that we can then track the additional expenditure associated with it. So a bit of IT work to do. One of the things, all these different service improvements uh, that, that we've got is to try not to make anything uh, labor intensive. Otherwise, we have to add the cost of that on top. So we'll yeah. uh, we'll see if we can get our ICT colleagues, our, our clever people to actually um, track both, where there's a complaint uh, on a job that's uh, been complained about how much it, it costs. Um, we'll speak to them and see what they can do for us. Okay, thanks, Bill. And yes, I hope it doesn't add more costs or too much time or anything. Okay, I think that's it then. Um, I'd like to thank um, all the officers um, for all your work on this and for coming along to the meeting and for your expertise on this. Um, I do believe it's seven o'clock, so you're, yes, so you're welcome to leave unless you'd like to stay. Uh, but thank you very much for that. Thank you and good evening. Oh, Celestia? Yes, sorry, just before Bill and there is a leave for the meeting, um, just to confirm that that um, what Bill had suggested about um, uh, that data being provided, that is not a formal recommendation, but rather a request from the panel. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, okay. I don't think it was going to be a proper recommendation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Celeste. Okay, thank you so much, officers. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is um the housing and homelessness panel work plan. Um Celeste, can I hand over to you to introduce the item, please? Yes. Um Thank you, Chair. Um, the committee would have noted that uh, the Landlord Services Transformation item had slipped from this evening's agenda. This item has been deferred to a future meeting. I believe um, uh, uh, Bill uh, alluded that it is going to be in the December me meeting, but um, yes, we'll be meeting with Councillor Diggins, who is the chair, to confirm any amendments to the work plan. But also, given the recent changes to the forward plan, the three items will need to be taken to the panel's meeting in November, including the HRA business plan, the asset strategy and five-year investment program, and the tenancy engagement and management. Um, yes, yeah, so items are currently listed for November in the work plan for this panel will need to be deferred to a future meeting, subject to agreement by Councillor Diggins. Thank you. 
Thank you, Celeste. Um, and I'd like to ask the panel to note the work plan and any amendments can be undertaken by the scrutiny and governance advisor in consultation with the chair if any um, changes are required outside of panel meetings. I'd also like to um, bring to the panel's attention that the November meeting may potentially change from 7th November to 27th November. So this isn't confirmed yet, it might take place and just to check availabilities um, should this change take place. Does anyone have any questions or comments? No, um, if the meeting does um, change to 27th November, I'm sure Celeste and the chair will let us know as soon as possible. Okay, thank you for that. And then the final item is just dates of the future meetings. Oh, have I missed something? Yes, I have, so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> item 10 is a report back on recommendations. So the panel didn't make any recommendations on the previ previous cabinet reports it considered. Therefore, there's a, no updates uh, to report back on this time. Um, and then finally, uh, dates of the future meetings, they are um, at the moment 7th November, but that's subject to change. And then, um, yes, and then the other one's 4th March. Any questions or anything before we leave? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Edward and Rosie and Jonathan, Celeste, Linda, everyone. I hope you have a good night. Thank you. Right, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks.